I am here to interview John Brown, who was the ex-headmaster of Waldgate School uh, from 1973. John, when you first came to Waldgate in 1973 to be interviewed for the post of headmaster, what did you know about the school at the time and what were your impressions of it? Hmm. I actually knew very little about it. Uh, it was something of a surprise. So it was a surprise when I saw the advert and I thought I'd quite like to work for the East Riding but I decided I was not going to apply because that was going to trespass on a professional relationship that I'd had with Bob Thompson, the Chief Inspector where we, we got on very well and we went to a lot of places together, etc. And I thought, no, I'm not going to apply. Um, and so I didn't. And then on the Saturday night before the applications closed, then there was a telephone call to Tynemouth where I was living. And it was Bob Thompson's number two. <sighs> Bolton, who lived in Driffield, yeah. He was actually the deputy director. And he said, applications are due to close at sort of midnight tonight. Where's yours? I said, I couldn't do that. It would be presumptuous and embarrass you. Um, so should have be said just apply so i did um belatedly I, I mean i wrote something out on the sunday and stuck it in the post on the sunday afternoon and a bit surprised when i got called for interview i hadn't thought much about what i'd written at all other than that yeah all right if you want me to apply then i'll apply if it's not going to embarrass you then that's all right i'll go ahead so I did, and it was an interesting series of happenings, really. I mean, um, it was only a very brief visit around Woolgate prior to the interview, unlike current practice where people get a, quite a lot of time to say, am I going to fit into this place or not? Mm. It was really just a, a courtesy visit and a cup of coffee. A little more than that in terms of knowing about it. And a very brief introduction to Hayden Vaughan, the existing head. Um, and then the next thing was County Hall. The interviews were not conducted on the school site. They were in County Hall. Um, the chair of the committee was Peter Barker of considerable local repute who actually knew the school well and whose children had gone to Walgate anyway um, <clears throat> and he chaired the interviewing committee as well um, so um, and the, no, yes I suppose they came out at the end of the interview and they came and said would I accept the job which I was happy to do so we cleared the air and there was not going to be any complications about it so I was happy to accept um, and then they said oh by the way you need to live in the schoolhouse it's part of the contract which was fine actually because it meant we didn't have to look for a house and all we needed to do was sell the one in Tynemouth um, so it was a bonus there and then there was another afterthought that said oh and by the way you need to look after the evening institute and the youth club as well oh right I, I had an idea that that's how it should be because that's how it was in Cambridge under the village co college model and I have done just a little bit of research and discovered that the director of education for East Riding at the time had come from Cambridge as deputy director and he was determined that he saw the East Riding as 
a canvas for turning it into another Cambridge in terms of how the schools would be built and developed. So, um, John, do you have any particular memories of uh, the staff who were there when you began your headship? Mm, yeah, long serving already. I mean, people like Tom Pollock had been there from the, the very first day. Um, others had obviously joined as the school grew in numbers, but there was a substantial number. Bill Fletcher was there from the beginning. Um, and of course, Kathleen Oates as the second deputy had been there from the beginning. She came from a, a girls' grammar school in Warwickshire, although she was a York girl, um, lived in York. Um, so, yeah, um, Dave Glue, who came as a student from St John's and stayed, <laughs> which was pretty typical of Walgate. If somebody put their foot across the door and there were anything like, then they seemed to want to stay. So Dave Glue, Brian Walker had again come from St John's, Bill Fletcher had come from St John's, Bill Cowell had come from St John's. Um, it was a kind of recruiting ground for Walgate. Um, um, there were others, Harold Milson, a bit later, not right at the beginning, but they were all there and very well established. Chris Glendinning um, uh, come straight from college as well. Not, not local, because she's a Grimsby lass, um, Chris Glendinning. Um, so she trained in Lincolnshire somewhere. Um, Bill Cowell. Sorry? Bill Cowell. Yo, know, Bill Cowell, yes, he'd been there from the beginning. He came from a York school. He had previous experience. Not all of them had, you know. For recruiting in 1957 um, wasn't particularly easy, as I recall it. And um, people had not managed to build up a big backlog of experience that they could parade in front of, particularly if they wanted to come as a promoted post in some way or another. Um, so they were pretty young actually and, you know, take 60, 70 years off them and they were in the beginnings of their career. So Hayden had made a point of recruiting youngish staff usually supplemented by all sorts of local people who were qualified teachers often in um, quite extraordinary ways people who would teach needlework there was a lady from Bishop Wilton who came in to teach needlework um, on a part-time basis there's quite a lot of part-time work oh Ken Jones um, also ex-Navy man, um, Roy Lane, who'd come from um, the Army Education Corps in West Indies. And I sort of knew about that because I'd been in the Education Corps myself. So Roy and I had an affinity of shared experience. Um, I think that about covers the, the, the if I've forgotten somewhere. Oh. Um, chemistry, Peter Jones, who had come from industry um, and qualified, as I remember, doing an open university certificate of education. He, he hadn't gone to college of education or done a dip ed, as far as I remember. Charles Hall came from um, St John's as well, to, uh, in the middle of the 60s, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a strong nucleus and it continued to stay. I mean, all of those were pretty well there. Oh, Mel Skinner had come. Um, she had, was married to the head of geography at Market Wheaton School and wasn't working at all. And Goodman and where they lived had a tiny village school and they couldn't find any staff 
that was common enough for these t two teacher village schools that they couldn't find staff. So Merle, who was a, um, a qualified further education PE um, specialist you know, with an international hockey career behind her, um, ended up in Goodman and teaching infants. And then when Walgate opened, she saw the opportunity and came uh, to join the PE department. Um, that was a very significant addition. Mill Skinner made a lot of difference to that school, particularly, um, and in fairness to Bill Fletcher, he was keen on people doing well in sports and representing the school elsewhere. But the girls needed something like Merle Skinner to do the same. And I mean, several international and regional hockey players that Merle produced um, through her encouragement, people like Liz Slito and Gillian Huggan, uh, who both are England internationals, all about the influence that somebody like Merle Skinner had. And she was there well into the, she wasn't there in 57, it was probably early 60s when Merle joined. Um, Olive was very keen to expand the library, which was pretty minuscule and actually occupied the staff room, what is, or was, it probably isn't now, the staff room in a block opposite the office. That was Olive Asker's classroom cum library. Um, okay, um, yeah, perhaps I remember a couple of people in the English department, particularly um, David Gent, who had come from the Channel Islands um, as a, a second appointment i think his channel islands appointment was a first appointment so he came as head of department really taking over from mr vaughan who was doubling as head teacher and in charge of english for the very earliest years and so he needed a, a head of department so he could do some other things around the school uh, so there was David and very soon joined by Olive Asker, who I think probably came as a supply teacher originally um, to, to cover some temporary vacancy and stayed. Uh, she was a good librarian in the days when school libraries were in their infancy and needed development. She was a great lover of books and... Um, did very well about finding a niche for the library and it grew very well later on. I understand that there was then, post the time that I was there, that the library was closed, I understand, um, but is now reopened, which I'm pleased about. Uh, no school should be without one and no, no school should be without a school librarian because the space in the east end of the schools was pretty short and Hayden Vaughan had his office in the corner overlooking the exit and then Margaret Richardson and the secretarial staff had the office that fronted onto a block corridor and then there was the gents toilet and then there was the staff room working inwards and then into the medical room. Um, staff room pretty congested by this time. Staff were up to high 30s, early 40s at this stage I would think yeah. Um, so pretty short of space and it was early on that we needed to convert, find a bigger space for the staff and more space for office staff and indeed for myself. Not that I had any grand notions I was happy with Hayden Vaughan's corner but the, the general judgment was that 
that ought to go to the two deputies so that they could be more accessible to the school and hide me away a little bit in, uh, further on. So um, Margaret Richardson and Barbara Firth and Anne Allison um, largely removed themselves from the front office and occupied a couple of offices and then there was my office as the heads. And early days when I, I went then clearly I needed to be introduced to the staff so I can't quite remember how that happened but I was assailed by clouds of smoke they all smoked. Ken Jones, Roy Lane, um, they were all heavy smokers. It was still a relic of ex-war time, you know, where smoking was very prevalent. Um, they picked up the habit. They, mainly they'd had wartime or immediate post-war service. Uh, some of them had some national service in, in that sense as well. When you um, first started at the school in 1973, the school leaving age had just gone up to 16 and mm. the population of Poplington was growing. So what about the structure of the school, of the buildings? What yeah. had to happen? What developments took place? Yeah. To... Suddenly we were overcrowded. I think this was one of the things that Hayden Vaughan felt I really don't need to deal with. I've got these 16 year olds who don't want to be here um, or some of them and we've hardly got enough space for um, them when they do leave at 16. So uh, he had to face a building programme, a furniture programme, a facilities programme um, as well as the possibility of some reluctant 16 year olds who would quite like to stay off as much as they possibly could um, rather than come to school. Um, the pressing thing was accommodation and I do recall Andrew your comment about A-level history under the stairs after the tuck shop closed. Uh, that's magic that. Um, wonderful bit. There were other holes in the corner as well. I, um, I picked up A-level geology with Sean Sheldon Dexter and a lad from North Yorkshire that lived so far out in the country in North Yorkshire he was nearer to Pocklington and Walgate School than to any North Yorkshire school. Clever lad. Um, emigrated to New Zealand um, anyway um, so we were getting people from all over the place actually as well it wasn't just the local intake that suddenly descended upon us yes there was new housing m more children coming into the town the primary school was bursting um, so yeah accommodation facilities trying to find spaces to do some teaching in was quite extraordinarily difficult a lot of people ended up with oh well uh, if it wasn't history in one of the labs um, then it was french in a maths of a uh, room or office we did manage to find odd small spaces for departmental offices and they often ended up as small group teaching as well and we're short of furniture um, a lot of it was pretty old furniture I mean most of the desks had inkwells in them I've said this story before haven't I that Dave Glue's first job when he came under the permanent staff was to go around filling the inkwells um, I mean, Dave never forgot that. Um, um, so, we had to find more furniture. There was some cast off furniture from um, a 
eventually when New Street Primary School closed and there was some cast off furniture there. But really we embarked on expeditions to buy furniture ourselves. And particularly this jumps forward a bit because this whole pressure of furniture and accommodation went on right through the 70s and into the 80s. And Cliff Stubbs, who succeeded Doug Green as deputy head, um, and Steve Barnsley from the art department, were instrumental in scouring the West Riding. And we went to sales of office blocks that were being closed down and the furniture was being sold. So there was a whole lot of furniture that was converted office desks that appeared in odd rooms where we could do some sixth form teaching then it wasn't unsuitable for that but there were some main school bits as well that had to take this kind of uh, adapted furniture that wasn't school furniture at all um, so there were several sunday mornings where governors and myself would gather on the east side playground to unload Mike Clough's articulated lorry of furniture. If you remember Clough's mm -hmm. building works, then Mike was a governor and instrumental in providing transport at the weekend for whatever we could bought at some auction sale in Bradford or somewhere and unload it. That nearly cost me my life because The loading onto Mike's articulated wagons was not necessarily done by professional stevedores or whatever you call people who load them. You know, they were piled in. And we were unloading one Sunday morning from one of his articulated lorries when his driver said, watch out and pushed me out of the way, a desk on the top of the pile with an iron frame was descending very rapidly. I actually did get a glancing blow from that. I mean, it was a near run thing. Um, but I also got a, a glancing blow because the, the driver pushed me and I fell against the wheel of the articulated lorry as well as this desk descending down this side. Close run thing that was. Yeah. So it was all sorts of contrivances. Um, Temporary classrooms and porter cabins. Oh, porter cabins. Um, notorious for porter cabins. Maximum number, I think, was 14. And yeah, that's an important point because we lost a really significant part of a rural community school. We lost the plots, and I mean literally the plots, that were run by an agricultural science teacher, Andrew Rolls particularly, I remember. Um, but prior to Andrew, I think Peter Jones had run them partly from the chemistry department. Um, and we lost that. I was upset about that because at one stage, we had opened negotiations, which suited my thinking, to be an outpost of Bishop Burton. It was as close as that because of the plots that we had at the back. And I, I was really keen on that, to have an outpost of a very important agricultural college on site that were already there from the beginning across the playground. Um, the metal workshop and the wood workshop and the motor vehicle shop, the unofficial motor vehicle shop. Um, and those were a terrific addition. I, yeah, what better can you have for a community school than 
uh, 14, 15 year olds getting mucky underneath a car um, down in um, a pit. Short sighted to close it, I felt sad. Um, okay, so in the late 1980s and 1990s, um, this was a, a very different yeah. period of time, really, wasn't it, for schools? We'd seen big government changes in education. There was the national curriculum, there was the introduction of GCSEs. And in addition, it's a period of time when advances in technology led to the introduction of computers. Mm. So what are your memories of the impact of such developments <laughs> on the school? I would start with the elementary BBC computer, single item, I think as I remember, just one of them originally, um, and trying to make sense out of that in what had been the science lab at the end of A block and had become the maths department under Tom Pollock and somehow or another um, then this sole BBC acorn got sighted in there. I think the thought was that if anybody could understand it then Tom Pollock and the maths department would probably understand it. Um, and I remember you know several attempts to get my head round it, um, not very successful ones at all really. Um, it was the start of a number of similar machines, BBC Acorns and copies of their minor variations of that, which progressively we added, probably in small numbers as I recall, we could perhaps afford three or four to add to the stock. and. As the number became a bit bigger from a single item, then instead of demonstrating, we, we could actually move over to having uh, computer classes. That was aided by night classes as well. There was another virtue of having um, Steve Whittle's adult education on site because that was a, an important element in an expanding adult institute curriculum that um, some of those we shared as I recall um, um, both sides benefited from them and uh, could use them at different times of the day um, and specialist computer teachers began to appear uh, that was pretty significant really uh, <laughs> Two things were changing at once. The curriculum content changed radically during the 70s and the 80s. But so did the style of teaching as well. The two went together and that pressed upon facilities. We came back to facilities yet again. Um, could classrooms be equipped with um, yes, a recorder? Could it be of the kind where children could report and record their voices on, you know? So curriculum changes like foreign languages becoming more practical, an expectation that you could speak and that oral communication in the foreign language loomed much larger than that was certainly a significant shift and it affected again accommodation and we were looking for facilities yet again. You need a different kind of set of desks and places for children to sit at if they are to participate in those kind of lessons. Um, and I suppose practical subjects as well the metalwork, the woodwork, the technical drawing, the art, the needlework, the domestic science were all shifting towards much more practical involvement. I think they probably always had been. 
but they were taught in a way which was fairly limited. And I think the way was changing. Everybody was going to do the practical and everybody was going to have their sandwich cake assessed, etc. Um, but the broadening of the curriculum, the enlargement of the school, the increase in acceptance that lots of people nationally were going to go to university, that that number was going to increase, then it was critically important that we actually raise standards. Not fair. Uh, that's not true. The standards were high, um, as indeed um, testimony to Jane's husband um, while we're talking. The standards were high, but for a limited number of people, we were widening that intake, widening mm. that clientele. Um, and that was something different. We had to do it, I felt. And perhaps the most significant thing that altered was uh, and it, it sounds a bit sort of showy offy but I felt it needed to be known that those academic standards not the actual standard itself but the broadening the availability to a much wider number of youngsters that had to be seen by the youngsters themselves in school, but it had to be seen by anybody else who was in school. So it was a period when I decided that the honours boards were really important. Mm. But those honours boards had to do more than just academic stuff. All right, they might take up the biggest number of boards, but the school already had a, an excellent reputation via Mel Skinner and Bill Fletcher on the sporting side. That needed to be up there. The D of E needed to be up there as well. So it's back to community and a breadth of um, appreciation of, yes, standards had to raise, we had to aim high and I think we did. Um, certainly, the intake changed. Socioeconomically, it changed. And there were more people who'd come to live in Poplington, who'd come perhaps from cities, and they were a bit further along the line about. Um, how important it was for their children to go on to higher education or to fully qualified work. That spread actually into the villages, you know. Um, it's the impetus for getting that broadened across the whole of the catchment area was the influx of newcomers into the town and into some of the villages as well, Stamford Bridge particularly. Um, and that was an incentive to, yes, raise for everybody, really to broaden the accessibility to um, higher education, to perhaps overcome the notion that you were finished your education at 15 or even 16 as the leaving age raised, that there was more to do and really you ought to go away from Walgate thinking, what am I going to do next? caliber of staff that came to the fore in that accident it was a stunning revelation how lucky we were 
people of immense quality that rose to the, an awful occasion. Dave Glue, Chance Hall, Rosemary Harrison, they were stunning characters who got us through the most appalling time. Mm. And I'd have to say Hilary Sainer as Chair of Governors there as well. Um, sorry, that actually, that bit just brings back tears a bit for me, that it does. It's been one of the hardest things. I mean, most schools don't have anything like that. To no. It's no. really difficult, no. but yeah. And the saint-like quality of people involved it ought not to go unrecorded somehow that Rosemary Harrison, you know, not only felt great compassion for children who were injured, parents who were devastated by it and did enormously good work with all of those and therapy classes after school, but she thought about the driver who was imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And she visited that driver, you know. And I quite think she saved his life because it was such an impact on him, according to her, that it had destroyed his mind. I mean, he was not the kind of ramshackle, careless driver. He had a family himself and 10 years imprisonment was, I mean, real torture for him. And she went, mm. she saw him regularly and uh, I guess he would save her life but by Jove that brought out the character it brought out the character in the kids as well uh, I shouldn't forget that and I do treasure that picture of we did all sorts of unofficial things really you know came back part-time ones that had been injured came back with no need to move around the school. They could stay with one person if they wanted to. And this lad who stayed with Steve Barnsley all the time and just therapeutic began to learn to speak again after an unspeakably hideous accident that lost him his speech. Learned to speak through Learning to draw with Steve Barnsley. Mm. And that picture of a, a bowl of fruit that he drew was absolutely precious, which reminds me in the removals, the, the glass has not cracked and I need to replace the glass in that. But it was all about community again. I mean, the school rallied round that staff were wonderful parents were wonderful kids were extremely brave 57 casualties mm. all of whom spent some time in hospital and some of whom like the lad that lost his speech spent weeks in hospital right does that do mm. Mm. yes the driver of Philip's buses could ring me up on a Friday afternoon at school and say, Hey, John, you better get them ready. It's snowing up here, you know. <laughs> I'll be doom for ten past three. Have them out in the playground, will you? Right. Those early years, 1970s, had some really severe winters. Mm. And those rickety old buses, um, somebody reminded me just a couple of days ago about two of the drivers. Jane will probably remember them. Shirley Kent and Frida, I think, something like Frida. Lady drivers on Phillips buses a lot of the time. And of course, the stories of where did you, why didn't you do your homework? It dropped through the floor of Philip's buses on the way up Killixer. That was true. There was a hole at the back of Philip's buses. 
We want some fun boss bosses of a little bit better repute, if you recall yes. those, because they did Bishop Wilton. Bailey's, yeah. Bailey's, yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Is there anything that you think is your own special contribution to the life of the school? In the beginning, I think it was that I'd come from a, the privilege of a wider working experience. I mean, that work with the HM Inspectorate and Schools Council was critically important. I had seen other places. So I brought something, I think, to Vulgate and to Pocklington from the, the, the wider country as it were, that maybe, might not, it probably would have done, but might not have uh, infiltrated the thinking quite so early. So I think I brought that.